I, um, you guys don't know, I kind of oops and um, waited till the last minute to ask her to do this. So literally on a couple of days notice, she agreed to sponsor it. They are the wonderful makers of Adipon and Betavet, which are probably the two we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna get started. Um, like I said, we're doing this one a little bit differently tonight. Um, usually we pick some sort of specific thing like Cushing's disease or arthritis, and this, this time we're gonna pick a, a piece of anatomy, basically, that we're gonna talk about. Um, it actually has, I, I think, probably the, the most problems of just about any joint that we see, and we'll, we'll go through it, but it's, it's an incredibly complicated one. Um, we'll start with just a slide or two of anatomy and just kind of make sure everybody understands why it's such a, a pain in our you know what because it's basically got all these different joints all these different tendons ligaments um, everything goes wrong with it um, but the great news about it is there's a lot of treatments for it and actually a lot of them are like proven and effective treatments so it's not just um, you know kind of there's nothing to do once you find out there's a problem there's actually a lot to do about it so it is a good a good topic in that sense um, just like everything it's designed to be very interactive I actually have free gifts for people um, who answer questions correctly. I don't know how we're going to do it because there's, there's probably almost enough for everybody to have something, but uh, we have, we have Adequan hats, which actually I love these hats, um, and then Adequan buckets, and um, so a lot of really good things to go. So I'll ask some questions along the way as we go. Yeah. Is this about horses? Yes. <laughs> So, to start out with, what is the big bone that comes down that forms like the top of the hawk? Femur. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're not starting off on no gifts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tibia, right, is the one that comes down, the, the big one. And then how about the bone below, the big bone below it? Cannon yeah, cannon bone, or we call it like the metatarsal bone. Um, but yeah, basically the cannon bone. And so remember, this is kind of like the heel of your foot, so it's like they're all sort of screwed up if you compare them to people, but, uh, but that's okay. So what is so sort of, like I said, different and interesting about the horse is that the hawk actually, unlike almost any other joint, it's actually made up of four joints, and that's what's sort of a little bit unique. We always talk about it as the hawk, but it's actually four different joints, and they're all very different. So this one down here is the first joint. That's the tarsal metatarsal joint, and that's, as you can see, a really tiny one, and it hardly moves at all. Next one is the distal intertarsal joint, and that's another one that's just kind of a thin line. It really doesn't move very much either. Um, then the proximal intertarsal joint, that one again, doesn't really move a whole lot. And then we got this huge joint up here, the tarsal metatarsal joint, that moves a lot, right? That's when the horse like bends its leg, you know what I mean? It makes that big motion. That's that one folding up. Um, and so that's a super important point because as we'll talk about it, it all depends on which joint is diseased in the horse. So if you have big problems in these little tiny joints, mm. it's not that they're not painful, but the joints really don't move that much. And so you know, if you essentially dump a bunch of medications in them and make it feel better, the consequences aren't really that high down the road. Um, it, it's not, it doesn't have the same impact. Whereas we don't have the same luxury necessarily with these, the bigger high motion joints. How does that Um, first to, to humans, um, I confess I don't know enough about the, the human stuff. <laughs> <laughs> These are basically, essentially, don't move at all. And then the hawk is really just hinged though, because it doesn't, I mean, I don't think it can never move side to side, but it doesn't do it. It's actually, it's, it's um, because of the way the x-ray is shot, like if you see it from the front, it is more of a straight, just up, up and down point. <laughs> Um, as far as like tendons and ligaments, does anybody know some of the names of the big ones that go around the hawk? There's some really important ones that you can mess up around it. Anybody? The dispensary starts right at the back of it, so it, it actually, it's a good point. It's one that we often have trouble dis, um, distinguishing which thing is causing the pain because it starts right back here. So if you, you know, treat or um, numb the hawk joint, you often get the suspensory and vice versa. So they cause us a lot of problems. It's not really part of the joint, but it, it, the two are so close to each other that we have a lot of trouble sometimes telling 
where the pain is coming from between the two of them. How about any of the big ones that like either come down the front or come down the back? There's some really... Cruciate. What's that? Cruciate. Cruciates are, the main cruciates are up in your, site, in your knee and your cycle, so one joint higher. Has anybody ever heard of, there's kind of a, a really important one, I don't know if anybody sees it, it's called the, the Peronius Tertius, it's the one that comes down the front and is in charge of pulling your, your lower <laughs> leg forward. And the reason is it's really important is that we have horses, um, we actually get them somewhat frequently that rupture it, and it's got a really classic thing, I actually, I find it to be a great video, but I won't show it, it's really distressing, but essentially the horse, they catch their leg behind them, and then it essentially rip the whole thing on the front. And it's really, the horses actually do okay, but when it initially happens, it's, it's really shocking. I mean, essentially the horse's whole leg just goes straight behind it. Like there's nothing holding it back. And so it's one of those things like in veterinary medicine, there's not that many things that you don't need, you know, any test really to tell you what it is, just the exam. And that's one of those things that if you pick up the horse's leg and the bottom part goes this way while the top part goes this way, <laughs> then you basically, that, that's the thing that you ruptured. How about any of the other, you guys, just like people like the gastrocnemius is like a big one that comes down. And then the usual ones like the superficial flexor and the deep flexor come down um, along the sort of the back and the side. And then there's tons of ligaments that basically go you know, on either side of the hock. So it's a, you'll see as we go, this is our problem. So essentially there's four joints instead of one like there is in most of them. There's probably 10 or 15 different tendons and ligaments. Um, and it's just, it makes it diagnosing problems in the hock sometimes very challenging. All right, so I always like, breaking things down into really simple things. So basically the things that go wrong with your hawk, right? Either you were born with the problem, something happened like an injury, some trauma, something crashed into it, or you got old. Essentially your, you know, your joints started to degenerate. So anybody have any idea what's shown in the x-ray today? This is not a hat question yet. Anybody? <laughs> what's that, any? Sorry. <laughs> not dislocated. I give a hint, it's from a pole. Uh, oh. Yeah, exactly, so it's a premature pull, and basically the bones oh. of the hawk haven't even formed yet. So this is an example of one where you're born with it, so you're born with no bones, and if you don't, like we don't treat these really, really carefully in the ICU and hold them down and not let them stand, then as those bones form, they crush them, and you end up with horses that really are ne almost never sound. Um, so that's a great example of being born with it. What's another example that you don't exactly born with it, but your genes kind of lead to this, yeah, to, to something early in life. What's the sort of common thing that whenever we're looking at baby horses and we're doing pre-purchases and stuff, what are we looking for all the time? Juvenile arthritis? Uh, juvenile arthritis would be an example. The other one I'm thinking of, I think you kind of, let's say, yeah, OCD. So osteochondrosis, when you get these, and I have some good pictures of it later, you get these little like, pieces of bone or flaps of bone that aren't adhered or aren't stuck down very well. And we'll talk about it at the end. It's a, it's a good reason to screen young horses, like if you're buying them, because it, it definitely is unfortunate if you especially invest a lot of money in buying a young horse and then find out that actually it's got this, this problem in its hock and it's gonna have to have surgeries or, or things like that to, to fix it. So, yeah. I know very little about poles, but how long does it take the bone in the carcass joint to start, or the hock to start? Um, I guess kind of two different questions. Like one like this, you know, that I think would probably take a month or two to, to finish forming. Like that's that's quite a ways away. Um, then the growth plates, as you probably know, they like they close at, at different intervals depending on where you are in the body, and uh, all the way up to even like almost two years sometimes. So it's, it depends on where you are. So. But then the whole, it, it, it within thirty days if it's free. Yeah, usually. I mean, again, it depends on how much premium, but I would say that the maximum, yeah, is usually about 30 to 40 days. Um, but you can imagine that's a long time for somebody to sit with a pole and hold it down. Um, <laughs> and exhausting. People, honestly, people do it. I mean, have had clients to do it. It's, it's a labor of love, no question, to, to do that. Um, trauma and injury, what do you guys think would be the most common ways that we see um, horses get injured in the hawk? Like, number one, probably. Kicking. Yeah, kicking. It's always like fights with other horses, or I hate to say it, um, it's usually them kicking fences. So yeah. they just sit there and kick, 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 kick until they they do something. Um, those are probably obviously the most most frustrating. Um, yeah. What about sliding your horse? Is that is that another one? That's something okay. Yeah. So that's sort of the the other category are basically. Um, you know, exercise-induced or performance-induced, um, and that's, you know, those are typically, 
not as likely to be, I mean they can be, but maybe not quite as likely to be things like fractures, the way we see like sometimes with kicking, you know, you'll kick and you shatter something, whereas a lot of the performance ones tend to be more soft tissue injuries where like you said, they either stop real hard or they, you know, jump jump the fence, you know, and, and land badly. If you're a dressage horse, you, you know, overexert yourself and so you, you like I said, you tear some of the ones back there. So. What um what would be some common ones? We talked about what some of the tendons and ligaments are, but what would be some common ones for in injury? And how about um, well, they could, like it started like a dressage horse. So what would a, what would be a common injury for a dressage horse around around the hog? Yeah, suspensories. We'll do it. I mean, they can all injure any any of these structures. So I mean, we're kind of making generalizations, um, but definitely like suspensories. Um, how about jumping horses? So we can still be suspensories, but they'll do the tendons, you know, sometimes like the um, superficial and the deep flexor tendon. Um, Western horses, like was mentioned, they can, they get a lot of hock disease, but also um, joint disease, but they can also tear some of those big structures. How about, does anybody know what curb is? This is one of those ones that I, we always like to, people throw out these words and I'm not sure, they're, they're kind of a, having, having grown up in the horse world, it's like you learn these words first, then you get to veterinary school, and then they have very different names, but, but essentially, does everybody know what I'm talking about when I say curve? It's like that thickening right at the back of the hock. Um, it's like if you look at a horse from the side on the hock, it'd be right here. You'll see just like, a, it looks like a bulge. It's a little bit like a bow tendon, except in the other, in a different spot. Um, and it's really classic. I don't know if you guys, anybody have a horse with it? Um, so, Basically, it can either be, um, it can either just be from trauma, like it just thickening, which we do see sometimes. It can be a tear in the plantar ligament, which is like right at the back of the hock, or it can also be a tear in the superficial flexor tendon. So it can be any of them, but they all have the same look. And so if you guys have a horse that you look at from the side of the hock, and there's like this just little bow of, of tissue, um, like swelling right at the back, very important to get it ultrasounded because one of those, just where they bruise it, is not such a big deal. It's not, it doesn't really limit their career. But the other two, you need to take a rest immediately, and then they usually end up fine, but you don't want to just keep going. How would you know the difference between a curve and a, and a um, cat cock? Cat? They're, um, cat cocks typically are more like the bubble sort of on the top, whereas curve, it's like just that sort of like, you know, like I, said, I think of it as it looks more like a bow tendon, like it really looks like a bow yeah. tissue, yeah. yeah. Whereas a cat cock's kind of like right on the, literally capped, yeah, capped to the hog. Um, yeah. At the moment of the trauma or the injury, could there be a length of time before it's obvious? Um, yeah, no, that, that's definitely probably true. I, I think the best example of that usually is like endurance horses. I feel like you yes. know, they, they go through the ride and then the next day people find the swelling. Okay. Uh, I think you see it in the vet horses okay. sometimes too. But yeah, no, that's a, there definitely can be a delay. Okay. How about uh, another um, common term that I, people are not like, like uh, there's different ways to pronounce it, like thrupin or thrupin. I've heard, oh, yeah. Them. Yeah, you guys, anybody had one of those? So that's like a little bit higher. If there's like essentially a, a um, big sort of tube of fluid right up here. Um, and that's again, it's, it's the tarsal sheath. So it's this like fluid filled structure that carries all the tendons and ligaments. And so this goes back to kind of what I was saying in the beginning is that there are so many different structures in the hawk. And it's really important that, you know, you're, you're always looking at them and depending on which one you see, you know, get us to help you because sometimes some of these are actually like classic enough that even over the phone, like if somebody describes to me, they're like, hey, it's got a lump and it's right on the back and it looks like this. I'll say, oh yeah, it sounds like curb, you know, it's probably one of these or it's got a tube of fluid right here on the hock. That sounds like, you know, probably a deep flexor tendon lesion. So it, it's actually, again, one of the nice things about the hock is that depending if you know the location, you can actually often solve, you know, what, what the cause is. So kind of an interesting, interesting joint in that way. And then how about the getting old? What, what do you guys think are some of the common things that happen when you get old? Yeah, that's right, arthritis. So, and this is probably the thing we talk about the most in hawks. I, for anybody that's got performance horses, this is, I mean, just almost constantly, we're x-raying horses, hawks, trying to see if they have arthritis or joint disease. Uh, we'll show some good pictures of it. I think it's, it's really good to understand what it is, and we can talk about it when we get to the pictures. It's hard, I think, for us, and definitely for, for everybody, is that most horses have some, it's kind of like people, right? I mean, there's plenty of people out there doing all kinds of things, triathlons and stuff, but have not so great, you know, x-rays of their knees. It, so one of our jobs is to help you. I mean, just because they have some arthritis doesn't mean that they're done or they can't, you know, they can't go on in life, it, but it does mean that, you know, we might have to manage them a little bit differently, but it, it is a great area where we can kind of help you decide how bad it really is and, and if it's a problem. 
All right, so signs that you have a Hawk problem. Um, so number one, I was tell you about is swelling is a great one. And going back to kind of thinking about back to that x-ray, right? Those three little joints at the bottom, they're so teeny. And so a problem in those, you don't really get a lot of swelling. There's just no, it's, they're not very big. But the upper joint, which will be this one kind of like right here, um, is huge. It's like this big, just kind of water balloon. So if any problems in that joint, it tends to just blow up into this big kind of balloony structure. So anytime you see a bunch of swelling in the hawk, it's again very good to at least talk to us about it. Um, some of them, like I said, are really, really treatable. There's obviously some that aren't. Um, but do you guys know what, what's kind of, the, again, the sort of the common term for that when they get that big kind of balloony look to them? Yes, talk to people call, a lot of people call bog spabbing, like if that, as opposed to like bone spabbing. What's that? Oh, right there, there you go. <laughs> Um, and again, I, don't, I confess, I don't exactly know how all these came about. I learned them as a kid, but I don't know exactly, you know, why, why something's called curb versus, <laughs> versus not. But anyways, these, these terms exist, so we, we still use them. Um, but again, swelling, probably the single most important thing to look for. Lameness is obviously a big part of it, so especially if the two are combined. The hard part about lameness, right, and I think anybody that's been to some of the lameness like, demonstrations that we give is that you can be laying anywhere in the leg, so it's not specific, right? If you're limping on your leg, um, it doesn't mean that it's the hawk, it could be the stifle, it could be anywhere else. And again, I, I think we've, we've been through this at other talks, but remember, as, as much as it might look very clear that it's got to be that joint, you know, like, oh, the way he's moving his leg, it, it just looks like his hawk hurts. When you go and actually like sort of numb it out and figure it out, honestly, a lot of the time it, it doesn't fit that very well. Horses do so many interesting things to compensate and it depends on whether it's on the inside of the leg or the outside of the leg, if it's in the foot, if it's in the hip. And so just watching the horse go is hard sometimes to say, oh yeah, that's a hawk problem. There are some little rules that we use sometimes about, you know, sort of type, you know, the performance that the horse does, the type of sport they do can help. Um, certainly the breed can help. Um, but if you don't have any swelling there, just seeing lameness doesn't necessarily mean that it's the hawk. And then the same with heat, that is one of the best things for us again, is if you, you know, we run our hands down the leg and there's like focal heat right around the hawk, and especially they just, you know, did a, uh, an event and came out of it, and now they're laying, that, that really helps us a lot. Um, we're looking for like essentially what we call localizing signs, so things that you'll appreciate this as we get to the next couple of slides, things that basically save us steps, right? We prefer not to have to do nerve blocks and things trying to figure out where it is in the leg. We'd like to just jump straight to the, the test and make the diagnosis. So if we can find swelling or heat, that lets us basically bypass a lot of the, the other tests, which is really nice. Okay, as far as the tests go, um, some of the best ones um, obviously are the exam. Like I said, that's a, a huge, huge one on um, any type of swelling. And then what other tests do we often do during the exam that really helps us maybe make, make us think that the hawk might be the problem? Yeah, flexion test, and so I think everybody's kind of familiar with them. What's one of the problems with the flexion test for the hawk, though? And, and this is, we're all guilty of this, but when you flex the hawk, you also flex something else. Yeah, the stifle. The two are essentially kind of joined yeah. to each other, and so just because the horse goes off positive, it doesn't mean it has to be the hawk. It's basically usually the hawk or the stifle. Um, the other problem, which I don't know, again, if anybody here has bad knees, but like if I flexed my knee, I would be very crippled after a minute of doing that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, I mean that I'm lame or that you know, I didn't just break my toe or something totally different. It just means that I, you know, don't have the greatest, greatest knees. And so that's, that's one of the problems that we have is that it's not so simple, unfortunately, it's just um, doing the flexion test, but it really helps. And I will say that if they're not positive deflection, it certainly makes problems in the hawk get a lot lower because if you're putting all that stress on a joint, you're basically, you know, kind of swooshing all the joints together, you're putting all that pressure on the tendons and ligaments everywhere. If it does nothing, then the chances that one of them are, are really making the horse lame or probably goes down a little bit. Nerve blocks, is everybody pretty familiar with that? I, I always kind of explain it as the concept. It's basically because horses can't talk, it's our way of, of them telling us which part of the leg hurts. And so for anybody that's seen them, it's kind of an exhausting process. You know, we watch the horse trot, we all agree, yes, it's lame. Um, then we numb out its foot, and if all of a sudden it goes sound, that means it was in the foot, because that's the part that was sore. If we numb out its foot and it doesn't go sound, then we go up to its ankle, and then if it goes sound, that means it was the ankle, and we just work our way up. What, what can you guys imagine, what are some of the problems with, with doing that approach with the hawks? Um, one of them's kind of obvious, I guess. But. 
Yeah, long, long legs are particularly on. It's a hind leg, right? And so this is a problem if you're a veterinarian, this is awful, right? We hate diagnosing hog problems with nerve blocks because you get to put in, you know, 10 different needles in the horse's leg by the time you get to the hawk. And at that point, you know, you can imagine the average horse is not stupid. You know, you're walking towards the needle, and they know exactly what you're going to do. So um, we really, really would prefer not to do this, but sometimes we have, have no choice. But it's why you'll see us, you know, doing all these flexion tests, and sometimes we'll even maybe x-ray the hawk first if we're suspicious, and then go back and do the nerve blocks, because, you know, we would prefer not to get kicked ourselves, but also, as you guys can imagine, it's not great for the horse either. I mean, you get a needle halfway in, they kick, the needle gets loose, it's, you know, or somewhere you don't want it. So it's, it's not a great setup. And the, the problem we run into, too, is that for most of these, um, it's not so simple to sedate the horse because the sedation changes, you know, their lameness and their gait. So if you sedate the horse and then do the block and then watch it trot, it's all screwed up, basically. You can't use it. So it's really frustrating, um, but sometimes it's the way it goes. X-rays, you guys will see, that's probably the most common one we do, and that's for the reason that and we'll get to it, that basically OCD, the osteochondrosis, and the hawk arthritis are by far, like, number, the two most common things that we see as far as problems in the hawk, and they're both really easily diagnosed on an X-ray, and so it's one of those things that we, you know, often will jump to the X-ray if, if we have a horse with, like, a swollen hawk, um, rather than doing the nerve blocks, because it's like, well, the hawk is swollen, and the X-rays are so useful, they're so definitive, that it's better to just go ahead and jump to them and get the answer. On the flip side, ultrasound can sometimes be tough. Um, it's, like I said, there are so many different structures in the hawk. It, as you guys I'm sure have seen, I mean, ultrasound is wonderful for like the, you know, suspensory, superficial, deep flexor tendon, that, that whole region, the back of the cannon bone is great because it's all sort of laid out. It, they're all separated really well. It's very straightforward making diagnosis. The problems in the hawk is you've got all these ligaments that are crisscrossing each other. And so anytime you have swelling, everything starts to get pushed in different directions. Mm -hmm. and so. It's not that we don't make the diagnosis with ultrasound, it's just that it, it is probably a little less clear sometimes. There's even ligaments in between all the little hawk bones, which we can't even see with the ultrasound. So it, it can be a lot trickier. Um, and again, it's why we probably almost always x-ray the hawk first and then ultrasound the hawk. And then lastly is MRI. I'll show a couple pictures of it. It's obviously wonderful. I mean, you can basically just see everything, um, but it, you know, it is definitely a little bit more expensive. And if we can get an answer on x-rays, we'd much rather do that than All right, so as far as x-rays, um, here we'll start, now we're starting the hat and bucket questions. So um, who would like to guess as to um, what what problem is shown on this x-ray? Somebody's gonna have to raise their hand though, so I should call. Okay, yes. Arthritis. Yes, great, all right. You want a hat or a bucket? Hat or a bucket? Hat. Hat, that's a hat, the hats are great, there you go. All right, and then the second question, which for a hat or a bucket would be, um, do you guys, which joints are involved? Yeah. Lower joints. Yeah, very good. So you guys have to. So can everybody kind of see that? So I mean, I can go back to the first one if you want. But in the first one, everything was like it was a nice, nice, clear black line between the joints. The bones were nice and smooth. This looks just like sort of mangled. Is how I describe it. Like it's all kind of rough and chewed up looking. So basically, this horse actually has pretty significant arthritis. I don't want to say it's the worst we've ever seen, but it's basically the joints are actually starting to fuse um, as part of the part of it there. Um, so this would be a very kind of classic example of hawk, you know, hawk arthritis in the really common joints. Um, notice that like the other joints actually don't look too bad, like this upper one in particular. There might be a little bit there, um, but really those two lower ones, um, you know, have, have a lot of hawk arthritis. So this is an example of a, um, I think it's a Western Pleasure horse um, that you know has some pretty significant horses. And actually, this horse is only about six years old, so it's actually oh, not, yeah. not very old. Oh, it has a lot of arthritis already, so um, it's got a long way to go. I know. Is that horse going to be lame? So the question is, is that horse going to be lame? Uh, it's a good question. What um, I kind of have two answers. It's quite lame right now, and then when we medicate it, it talks it's better. What might make it stop being lame over time? Possibly. Yeah, so sometimes you end up with the joints fuse. Either we help them fuse, or they can fuse on their own sometimes, and so then, then often the horses will actually get more comfortable at some point. Um, like I said, they're an interesting joint in that sense because, again, they, they don't move very much, so it's, they're a source of pain, but not necessarily, they don't actually limit their motion you know, very, very much, so fusing is probably not 
the end of the world. Well, what would cause that? Is that born with that, or is it overuse? You know, with all of them, I think it's probably um, multiple factors, right? I, I think it's probably a lot of it like confirmation dependent. Like if you, like as vets, a lot of times we'll look at some of these ones that are like either really, really sickle hawk or really, really straight hawk, and it's like, okay, I, you know, that, that horse is gonna put a lot more stress on them. Um, then use is gonna be a huge factor, you know, when they start riding them. And then I do think there's a component of luck. I mean, I think there's like, you know what I mean, you just happen to hit a hole when you were two years old, you know what I mean, and kind of wrench everything and it just set, set things in motion. So, I, I mean, I think you can do a lot by breeding, or sorry, you know, buying good breeding, but I think for some of it, it's just already, the cards are dealt, so to speak. Is it also developmental? Yes, no, I mean, I, developmental meaning, oh, this one isn't, but I, yes. Is that typical? Oh, to, to have that kind of, oh, for, um, well, the OCD wouldn't be in those joints, but you could, you would, I mean, you're correct in the sense that if you had OCD, you could get arthritis a lot younger, just not in these particular ones, yeah. No, that's a, that's a good point. Can, can we assume that, that with that condition, there would be limping, there would be obvious, obvious signs prior to, I mean, what? That is such a great and loaded question. Um, so <laughs> Sorry. That's, no, no, I mean, that's that's the problem that we face, right, is on pre purchases is there's horses that are completely sound, really, yes. from our estimates, yeah. and have hawks that look like that, and then there's other horses that are very lame with hawks that look like that, and mm -hmm. that's, I think, the problem that we have, right, is you bring your horse in for pre-purchase, we x-ray them, we say, oh, it's got hawk arthritis, don't buy it, Three years later, they talked to somebody who bought the horse and won all these, you know, medals or classes. Yeah, okay. and they're like, "You're an idiot. You know what I mean? Why'd you tell me not to buy the horse?" Yeah, okay. So it's, it's a it's a numbers game. Oh, okay. Is what I tell people. It's basically, I think if, if you have hawks that look like that and you're not lame, I think you have a good chance. You know what I mean? That you're okay. going to be lame in the future, but it's not a guarantee. Okay. There are, I think, just like people, you could have horrible looking joint, but you're just either you're just tough or you just it doesn't bother you for some reason. Um, so. It, um, symmetric, actually in this case, and I, um, some complicated circumstances about this one, we didn't have an x-ray of the other hawk, but, um, so I don't actually know, but you're right, it's often symmetric with the question, is, mm. is it usually symmetric, and it is often symmetric. Yeah. Oh, I, I, you think I planned it first. <laughs> <laughs> it's a candidate for adequate. <laughs> yes, it is, we'll get, to, we'll get to it at the end, but yeah, I mean, these are the horses that, um, I, I call them adequate for life candidates, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Betty has one, so there you go. <laughs> Betty was not a plant, though. I want to be very clear. <laughs> okay. All right. So for next um, T-shirt and hat, um, anybody know what's wrong in this X-ray? Out of focus. <laughs> out of focus is because of this problem. So <laughs> yeah, a lot of inflammation, but kind of secondary to... Effusion. Yeah, lots of effusion, but what the key is what's going on with this kind of bridge right here. Uh, this one is a good one. No, what did I say was the other really common? I don't know if I can so, like it's an example of really bad OCD, right? It's got basically all this like bone is kind of like loose and, and not adhered down is, is the way I think about it. So you have bone that's not like anchored to the, or cartilage I say, it's not anchored to the bone underneath. So, so it's kind of, kind of torn, but, but basically like you just have these like loose little pieces of cartilage. Yeah, osteoporosis, yeah, OCD. We are looking basically from the side, just kind of with an angle a little bit. So it's essentially kind of like the first one I showed you. We're shooting across. So this is like the, you know, the point of the hawk that you guys see. It's just instead of going perfectly straight, we're at an angle a little bit. So, um, D, all of the above. D, all of the above, yeah. So, um, so like this would be an example if you had a young horse, which this looks like it's actually is somewhat of a young horse. Um, you know, the question would be this particular one is, pretty significant, so it might change that, but, you know, we were faced with the question all the time, would you buy this horse if it has an OCD lesion? And a lot of people are shaking their head, depends on how you look at it, and I, I'm gonna now just, I guess, share some of the world of pre-purchases for people that, you know, maybe don't do them all the time. Um, you know, this is 
for a lot of people, a bargaining tool. I mean, literally, that's what it, it's become. Is that you know, if you find like an OC lesion, it's like, okay, we'd like to pay three thousand dollars less for the horse, and in return, we'll go have the surgery done. And the surgery is very effective. And so, you know, basically, you can have the surgery done and have the you know the little chip or whatever removed, and then you're maybe not quite good as new, but but awfully close. And so it's it's a it's an interesting world. I think there's some definitely people that would say absolutely not. You know, I mean, if it has an OC lesion, we're done. And then there's a group of people that would say, you know what, I'm very interested, but you know, I want to pay this much less for the horse because it had that. So it depends a little bit on you know the, the world that you're in. Yeah. Is it a candidate for Oswatch? A candidate for Oswatch? You know, I don't know that they're doing it as much for the OC lesions as they are for the the hawk arthritis. Um, I mean, I I'm kind of being flipped here. Any, anything's a candidate for Oswatch right now. I mean, I feel like it's so widely you know, being used, but it's it, I wouldn't say it would be like what we would consider the standard use of it. Um, I mean, as you probably know, it's really meant for navicular disease and it's kind of been, <laughs> you know, gradually expanded into all these other areas, which probably not a lot of research yet, but may maybe it's gonna be exciting in the future. What is that term? Oh, OSFOS, it was um, probably about a year ago we did a, a talk on it. It's, it's kind of a, it's a bisphosphonate, so it's a little bit like what, um, like um, women for osteoporosis take, it's the same kind of thing, but it's supposed to help. Uh, in this case, it's an injection, but um, and it's supposed to, like in the navicular bone, it's supposed to help them stop, you know, degenerating the bone and maybe even improve the bone density in the navicular bone. And so it's been applied sometimes to, to hawks, but again, with maybe not as much research backing it up. Um, does anybody, anybody here have a horse that they use with class Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's I think it's a very promising drug. I don't know that this particular situation, like with OC, would be the one that most people would do. Um, but again, probably more commonly for the other hot type of disease. All right. I don't know if that deserved a hat for anybody, but I'm not sure <laughs> okay. So this is this is kind of a tricky one. So this is an example. This is actually one of the joints um, in the hawk, mm -hmm. and it's an ultrasound of it. Mm -hmm. And so normally joints should be just it should be clear and black, right? Mm -hmm. it should be a lot of clear black fluid. And instead the joints filled with all this speckly stuff. So what would be two strong possibilities for a bunch of kind of swirly cells and speckly stuff inside of your hawk joint? Infection. Yeah, infection. infection. Okay, you, you can have the hat. You want a hat or the bucket? Hat. The hat is still okay. You guys will have to hand it back to her. <laughs> um, how about now? The second one is is tougher. So anybody have any ideas? Say your horse all of a sudden got in a fight with another horse, and now it's got a big swollen hawk and all this speckly, swirly stuff in it. What could have happened? Blood. Blood. Yeah. Who said blood? Oh, back there. Okay. You want a hat or a bucket? The bucket. The bucket. <laughs> I'm hoping you guys don't take the buckets because I take them to Trevis every year. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, maybe you can. That's why it's just a little cat. The bucket doubles his ass. The bucket doubles his ass. Yeah, that's right. So how, how can we tell the difference? So we have the ultrasound on it. Um, this will be a hat or bucket question too. So we have the ultrasound on it, it's got the swirly fluid. We're trying to decide, is it infected or is it bleeding? Because right, one is, we treat them really, really differently. So what's, how would you tell the difference? Yeah. Should we draw something? Sure, you draw something. Do you want the bucket or the hat? The hat, okay. Yeah, so the answer was to, to stick a needle in it, and that's really, Honestly, the easiest way to tell is we put a needle in, if we get blood back versus pus, then we know the difference. If it's infected, then they usually go to surgery and get flushed out. If there's blood, often we try to leave them alone for a while um, and just kind of let them clot it and, and maybe resolve it. Sometimes they still go to surgery, um, but we, we often at least don't do it right away. So um, definitely would prefer to have blood rather than pus in your joint, if at all possible. If we get clear fluid, how bad on the scale? Uh, clear fluid would be good. Then the, then the person doing the ultrasound didn't know what they were doing. No. <laughs> Something, something's wrong. We were at Blue's Basin. That's right. <laughs> no, clear fluid would be good. Like, clear is the best. It's good? Yeah, clear fluid's good. Cloudy fluid's bad. Blood's kind of in the middle. So, that's the way I think about it. All right. Oh, I know. So, yeah, these are other examples of pop -com. So. Yeah. I know. I always put this up for effect, but I do want to.
talk about it because it's actually really important. I actually, to be honest with you, would rather have this than like a little puncture wound to the hawk. And I know that sounds crazy, but that will take months and months to heal. But there's actually a good chance if it didn't actually go into the joint, like if the joint capsule is still intact, there's actually a good chance that you'll have a horse at the end of it that could do its job. It's going to have a big ugly scar. It might have you know, some areas that break open sometimes in the summer and, you know, and seal over again or something like that. But actually, in, in some ways, you'd be better to have that than some little pinhole, you know, puncture with a rusty nail or something into your joint. Um, and, and I would say that's not just out of a textbook, that, that's really our experiences too. I mean, these are horrible. And I mean, Dr. Eric Cole, more than anybody, you know, deals with some of these and they go on for months. But once they're all said and done, you know, you, you see the people down on the trail, you know, they I mean, a year later and they're riding their horse. Whereas, like I said, the ones with a little puncture to the hock and it got really infected, there's a group of those that, you know, we do end up putting the horses down. Like, it just, it, it, the infection's so bad and it destroys the joint. Um, if this happened to you, if you were out on the trail and, um, you know, again, your horse kicked, kicked at the wire fence and this happened, what um, what would you guys... Call you. Yeah, so scared of, if your cell phone didn't work. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, covering it is really the key, right? Because for us, especially when you're on the other end trying to, to um, deal with these, the worst is when they're just filled with like dirt and grass and stuff, because you're just like spending your whole time picking out these little tiny things. And it also means that you really can't close it, because you can't close you know, dirt and grass and stuff inside. So we actually, if, if you can, just whatever it is that you have available, you know, I mean, even if it's vet rapid padding or whatever it is, but just something to get it covered. Um, if you you know if you want to gently clean it with like a little bit of water, that's great. But even honestly, more important, like I said, is just to, to get it covered up. Um, how about nobody mentioned it, but how about something like a tourniquet? Anybody? No. Uh, no. No. Yeah. Um, we in general really don't um, don't like people to do that, especially in this area where a lot of people live, you know, an hour away or the trail right an hour away. So it's not like you're just down the street. So we've had tourniquets come in that you know have been on for two hours and things like that. And, um, you definitely want to be careful. We actually, on the flip side, we do use tourniquets a lot because I mean, when they're bleeding yeah. all over the place, it's really hard to deal with them. So we often will put a tourniquet on, but it's for a very fixed period of time and you know for a very certain effect. Yeah. Would it, would it be in a situation too, if you can wrap it, would you want it kept moist? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, if you guys have the ability, again, just as long as it's something clean, you know, relatively clean, like not, not pond water, so to speak, but you know, yeah, tap water, or, um, you know, or ideally even sterile water would be great. Um, and then as far as from our end, what, what are some ways to try to fix a wound like that? Like obviously suturing, but those sometimes can be really hard to suture. So has anybody seen there's some strategies we use to try to get something done? What's that? Graft, yeah, so if you can't get it to close at all and it's like a big open space, you can do grafting. Um, what about ways to try to get it closed? It, I don't know if you've ever seen these, they're kind of crazy, meta, but. That meta honey stuff? Meta honey, yeah, that can, you can do that for the wound. We'll actually do it a lot of times, we'll do what, it's called like a delayed closure, and so you do like maybe part of it initially and try to start almost like stretching it back together and then yeah. come back in another day or two you know, with bandaging, get some of the swelling out. And I don't know if everybody seen, like Dr. Morgan, does some of this, you can actually use like buttons and Velcro and essentially like, you know, pull them together and then when it starts to stretch a little bit and the swelling goes down, then you pull it together some more and over a couple of days you can finally get it. We try really, really hard to get the edges closer together, even if you can't actually get it to seal and heal because really, literally I tell people it's like, you know, sort of each inch of open skin is like another, you know, month and a half of your time, you know, bandaging, you know, every two to three days. So even if we can like cut the size of the wound in half, we might have just saved you, you know, four or five months of bandaging, you know, multiple days. Um, they're huge projects. Um, mm -hmm. As you can imagine, I mean, we have people literally who bring them to the clinic and, you know, just well, like basically, can you find a home for it? You know, we're, we can't do this. I mean, they're, you know, that, that could easily be six months of, you know what I mean, of bandaging, you know, multiple times a week. Um, they're, they're a lot to manage, but they do often have actually a really good outcome. You just have to be really patient with them. Do you know how that horse did that? No, I don't. Actually, I borrowed that picture from somebody, so I, I actually don't. I, I most of our well, you guys can you guys guess where, where do most of ours happen? That kind of wound. Wire. Yeah, it's usually wire. It's either um, people have metal sheeting at barns and they kick through them, um, or like wire fences, especially barbed wire. Um, it's it's hard. I mean, there's some perfectly good barns that have some metal sheeting, and the horse you know, gets out of the stall and then kicks at something, and it's 
it's not necessarily that they're all from bad facilities. It's just the wrong combination, bad, you know, wrong horse in the wrong place, and it, mm. it goes badly. So yeah. This is off the topic subject, but I, I don't ride trail. But do do are there trail horse first aid kits? There, there are, the, the only thing I would say is that it, a lot of it comes down to how much you want to carry with you and, okay. and, and there's kind of two extremes and we have okay. people who, you know, have like multiple saddlebags with you know, all this stuff and, <laughs> okay. and then some people, a lot of people will just carry maybe like, you know, some gauze and a roll of okay. vet wrap and I, I think something like that's probably reasonable. I mean, it's, it's not practical to take but so much stuff, yeah. but having something that you can at least, you know, cover a bleeding wound right. so you can get back to, you know, camp yeah. or wherever you are. To find some of the structures, yeah. So somewhere in here, <laughs> um, it's probably the extensor tendon. So there's there's like two extensor tendons that come down and they combine into one down here. And one of the interesting things is if they sever that, right, they they lose the ability to to um, pull part of their lower foot forward. Um, the other one I mentioned, like the peroneus tertius, and some of those are a little bit up higher and probably are ending in there. And then they can lose, like I said, the ability to stop their leg from you know like flipping behind them. It's actually, if, if you were gonna have a wound, like I said, uh, you guys, well, here's a good add-on question. If you're gonna have a wound, just raise your hand, would you rather have it on the front or the back? Anybody? Oh. Front. front, yeah, and then, oh, and then, do you want a hat or a? I have a hat, I want a bucket. Bucket, okay. <laughs> shoot, no, I'm just kidding. Um, why, why, why would you rather have it on the front, you know? Do I get to keep the bucket? Yes, <laughs> Cold therapy, 
um, anti-inflammatories, a couple of other joint treatments, but we'll, we'll talk about them. Um, we'll, we'll, some of them have different mechanisms, but um, very important. And then surgery, there's definitely, you're talking to a, a non-surgeon, an emergency medicine person who um, do, do, doesn't do surgery and tries to avoid it, so I'm, I'm always looking for ways to get around it, but there are certain things, like this is an example of an OCD lesion um, on arthroscopy, and so there's certain things where you just, I mean, that's the only way to fix it. It doesn't matter how many medications you put in the joint, it doesn't matter how much Adipone you give, that um, you, you can't get it, you can't fix it until you take the chip out, so um, that's, that's the reality. So I'll just go through a, a couple of these. Um, so as far as rest goes, um, how long is always um, a question. I put, I put this picture up kind of humorously. I, I want to talk a little bit too about what, what rest actually means, because it means something very different to a lot of people. I, I'm always interested, you know, if you tell, especially like I said, museum is an example, like endurance people, the horse needs to rest, that means turn down in the pasture and look at it again more than a year. Um, if you tell like a hunter jumper person that the horse needs to rest, it's to lock it in the stall and don't, you know, don't let it out um, for, you know, for the next however many months. And so, um, Again, it means things to very different people. I think we try to strike some kind of compromise. I tell people like the key is the horse has to stay quiet. So whether that's some horses that might be in a stall, a lot of horses that might be like a very small paddock. There's definitely horses where a large paddock is probably better. And there really are some horses where they're better turned down, where it's just they honestly, if you put them in a stall, they just spend the whole time racing back and forth, you know, looking for their friends. And you turn them out in the pasture and they just stand there and they do nothing. And so that, that horse probably is better off turned out. Um, whereas, like I said, the horse is just going to literally just gallop the pasture all day long with its friends. You know, it, it's not that it can't heal. You just, I think you have to accept that it. it's going to take a lot longer. There's going to be a lot of ups and downs. They're going to have a, a bad day where they overexert it and set yourself back a month or two. And then, you know, it'll go a little better again. Um, the length of time is just, as you can, as you can imagine, is entirely injury dependent. And that's why I tell you left of one of the very good reasons to get, like, a, you know, a diagnosis so you know what's wrong. Because again, like the example of the horse that bled into the joint, that's a much shorter, you know, recovery than the horse that tore its, you know, flexor tendon or, or did something like that. And so, to simply, you know, and I'm guilty of this too, honestly. You know, I mean, I'll, you know, go to, go to an injury try or something and have the horse get injured or, or not necessarily injured, but you know, be sore, have something that's puffy, and you give it a couple of weeks and it's gone, and you're like, okay, I, you know, it must be fine. But the problem is, unless you know what actually happened. It's very hard to say, you know, the swelling might be down, but if you, like I said, tore a tendon or a ligament, then as soon as you go back to work, it's just gonna happen again. So um, it, it's good to get a diagnosis. I would say again, as a general rule, most like soft tissue injuries are in the six to nine month kind of rehab. Um, they, they can be longer, but that's as a general rule. Um, most just kind of like in, inflamed joint kind of things tend to be more on the few, you know, few weeks kind of recovery. So. Um, there's, a, there's a big range. Um, ones that need surgery, obviously the surgery itself, and then there's you know a rehab after the surgery. But again, they tend to be shortest. The, the pretty much the, the longest ones almost always tend to be the soft tissue. Like if you tear something, um, that's going to be the longest rehab. Um, I mentioned controlled rehab again. That that really is the ideal. I mean, if you can do something where you know every day you walk the horse for 30 minutes and then you know gradually increase. Um, having said that, it is. Exhausting. It is a huge amount of work. Um, I again would be a hypocrite. I don't have time in my life to do it, so that's not. You know, I don't. I don't judge anybody who can't do that. But you know, if by the book, you know, the best is to keep them in a very small space and you know, literally do the sort of hand walking, gradual increase over the six to nine month period. Um, but again, we, we make a lot of things work, and honestly, have have good success with a lot of what I call modified exercise programs. Cold therapy, this is obviously a simple example of just cold posing. Um, you can do ice, you can do, I guess I've seen there's all kinds of crazy um, stuff out there that are some of them quite expensive of, of ways of cooling the leg. Um, I don't endorse any particular one, but definitely um, there's a, a huge place for cold therapy. I think by convention, most people do about 20 to 30 minutes and usually one to two times a day. Um, again, there, it depends a lot on which injury. Some of them are really close to the surface and you can cool them much quicker. Some of them are a lot deeper and you may never really change the temperature that far down. <coughs> there's, there's some interesting research looking at some of that. I mean, when they put little temperature probes, you know, down into the joint that you're icing and look at, obviously, just because it feels cool on the, the surface doesn't necessarily mean that the joint itself um, is that cold. Um, but those are some, again, some general guidelines. I don't think there's too many things you could hurt with rest and cold therapy. So if, for whatever reason, you know, you're not, your vet can't look at it for the next week or you're going out of town, you know, having somebody, you know, put the horse in a small paddock and, and cold pose or ice it for you, you know, once or twice a day, it's a pretty safe, safe thing um, to do. As far as anti-inflammatories, um, 
so what do you guys think here? There's a lot of different ways we can do them. So we can give them to them orally, we can give them to them IV in the muscle, um, we can even put them on topically. So what would be um, what would be some examples of we'll, we'll do some cats or some examples of oral anti-inflammatories? You, 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 you damn me. Oh, there's too many people. I don't yeah. like Dawson, sorry. You can, you can start the sign food answering question. <laughs> Stravacox, yeah, or, or Equiox really is what it's supposed to be, but I know what well, we all do. Um, so those are kind of the classic you know, anti-inflammatories. Of those, which tend to be maybe the safer ones, particularly if you have a horse that's um, maybe a little bit dehydrated or you know, just came back from the event. Yeah, Equiox is pretty safe. Even Bambi is probably pretty safe. Butte's the one we try to be careful with. If you have a horse that you know just came back from a trail ride and got hurt and maybe it was a hot day, Maybe try to avoid you know that that night just because until they're a little better hydrated. Um, it's one of those things. It's tough. It's, I think it's a little bit like some of these in people. It's most of the time it's fine, but when it's not, it's really not fine, and we have a lot of big problems with it. So, um, like I said, I grew up using a ton of it. I, I think of it as a safe drug, but I think there are. I, I definitely have colleagues that would call it a poison, really more than a drug. I mean, it, it is a one of the more dangerous ones if, if you use it the wrong way or the wrong time. How about topical? What would be the topical? Surpass, surpass. Yeah, surpass. Um, yeah. DMSO. DMSO, yeah, it's a little bit trickier as far as what its actual definition of, of what it does, but yeah, it's another good example of, of a way to decrease inflammation. So, um, so the next one I talk about is, is actually joint injection. So I don't know if you guys, probably a lot of you guys are familiar with it, but again, what we essentially do is put a needle into these joints and then medicate them. And so just like I'm sure a lot of you have had um, Injections into their, mm-hmm. you know, into your knee, into your shoulder. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is really, really, really common. Uh, I put a picture here. There, there's some. We actually have a choice of a few different steroids. Um, we used to kind of probably there's one called Depomedrol. We put in the hawks a lot, and then we're actually very excited. This one is called Betavet. We just um, it's been a year, now? Uh, about a year. Yeah, it's a product actually that I think when I was in vet school is when it went off the market. Right, it wasn't available. Yeah, and then for a long time it wasn't available, and then it came back. And I would say it's probably most most people's like preferred. It, it kind of combines a sort of one that acts a little bit faster and stronger in the beginning with one that can last a lot longer. And so we like it because it's kind of the best of both worlds. Is rather than having to pick between a, a faster acting one and a one that lasts longer, we're able to pick one that kind of does, does both. Um, and so I think it's probably at least for most of the doctors here, kind of become their their favorite. Um, but you know, like I said, there's a few different options. We usually put it with an antibiotic. Um, we often will, sometimes we'll put it with hyaluronic acid or HA um, that, as well, though in the hawks we often will just do this steroid. Uh, we're already at 8 o'clock, so we can go a little bit. <coughs> um, so talking about some other treatments, like I said, one of the ones that we, we use a ton is Adequan. I admit my bias, we have gossip here, and I use it on my own course, so um, I certainly disclose that up front. Um, it's, I think one of the reasons that we like it a whole lot is that um, you guys can give it yourselves. It's, it's in the muscle, so it's a lot easier one. The way I kind of think about it, and again, I can certainly um, jump into, but it's essentially, as opposed to something like somebody asked about Legend, that maybe um, targets more like the cells that, that line the, the, the lining of the joint capsule, we call them synoviocytes, as opposed to trying to help stop those make inflammation, this probably directs it more at the cartilage, and, and it's sort of where, it, where the inflammation is made in, in that that part of the joint, so you can have the inflammation coming from a whole bunch of different areas, and Adipon kind of targets one one specific area um, versus Legend, which targets a different area. So they're they're essentially achieve kind of the same thing, but but from two different you know two different ends. I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And you touched on it a couple times. You know, none of these drugs, steroids, you know, they they're never a standalone. I mean, I've never seen our drugs solve every problem, or I've never seen a steroid solve every problem. So it's important to have a plan beyond today, when your horse comes in and is sore. You know, the plan is we're gonna give it a steroid to reduce the inflammation, but there's gotta be a long-term plan, because you don't wanna just end up back there for another steroid injection in eight or 10 weeks. So, you know, using these drugs complementary, whether it's Legend and Natacon, post-steroid injection, or whatever, you know, that's that's the really important thing, I think, to work with your veterinarians on is that long-term plan past day one. It's going to be a counterprotective. Just quickly go through the last couple. Um, 
Other treatments, I just want to touch on one is, um, you guys probably heard of IRAP. Um, it's essentially where we pull the horse's blood. They do all kinds of cool things with some beads and other things to um, create this sort of um, anti-inflammatory, if you like, um, property that it's inside the, the blood. They sort of draw it out and, and really increase the levels of it, and then we give it back and we put it back in the joint itself. So it's kind of a, a trendy new thing that we try with some of them. I would say it's usually not maybe instead of steroids, but maybe in a case where like we've done steroids and then it's not, um, you know, they either didn't last as long as we wanted or we wanted to try you know a different approach. So you guys have, anybody that's heard of it, um, it's, it's a series of injections. It's like I said, we still probably go to steroids first in most cases, but it is one of the other ones that we use sometimes. And then, like I said, last thing, surgery, whether it is back to this kind of wound um, that requires surgery to fix, or like we talked about the OCDs, whether it's hocks, sometimes I'll, you know, use surgery to help fuse the hocks, there's a lot of different different options. Um, but again, it, it is one of the treatments that, that is very effective for, for certain conditions. And then lastly, like I said, just in conclusion, basically, number one, recognize the problem. So essentially identify that yes, your horse has a hock problem, whether we like to talk swelling or lameness, um, number two is let us help you get a diagnosis because just like we talked today, some of them have some very clear cut treatments, um, some of them not, not nearly so clear cut, um, but let, a, let us help you figure out how, mm -hmm. how to do it. Um, certainly, you know, starting treatment, whatever we, you know, sort out is going to be the best for your, your guy or your horse. Um, lastly, like I said, I just want to touch on the pre-purchase exam question. Um, I, you know, hawks are, hawks and feet are probably the two main things that we x-ray for pre-purchases and I genuinely encourage people to do it. I mean, there's obviously times when I understand that there, for, for lots of complicated reasons that people choose not to do the x-rays, but it really can save you a, a lifetime of, of problems. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to x-ray every joint in the horse, but getting, getting x-rays of the hocks, like I said, and or feet, um, if you identify a bunch of arthritis or identify OC early on in the process, um, at least you go in with, with eyes wide open. So I mean, if you go in and, and you might still decide to buy the horse anyways, but at least you know you're signing up for Adipon or hock injections or whatever it's going to be, um, rather than finding out in a year when the horse goes lame that you know it had this problem and you had no idea. So um, again, it, there are certainly each, each case is a little bit different, but that, that is the advantages of, of doing it.